Chapter 14, Financial System and Economic Growth. What is the role of financial systems like the banks, insurance companies, mutual funds, the stock market? What is its role in the economic growth of the country? This chapter is all about that. So there are two ways for financing. And there are two parties, the lender or the saver, the person who has the money, and the borrower or the spender who has a great idea. Money reaches the idea person or the entity by direct financing or indirect financing. So there are two types of financing. Financing is basically how the money flows from the person who has it, the saver, the lender, to the person who wants it, the borrower, the spender, the entrepreneur, right? And when it goes through direct financing, it goes through the financial markets. These lenders, they know these are the best borrowers, these companies are the best to invest in, so they buy their stocks, they buy their bonds. So that's direct financing through stock markets. Money flows directly from lenders to borrowers. That's direct financing. Indirect financing is when money flows through intermediaries, financial intermediaries like hedge funds, banks, insurance companies, and they can choose to directly invest your money that you have saved to the one who is trying to borrow. Or they can even eventually like directly spend it and invest to the borrower, or they can go again by the financial markets route. So you can deposit the money into your bank and the bank then lends it to the borrower or the bank can invest that money that you've deposited into your financial markets and, and buy and give it to the borrower and make money and give it back to you. So this financing of directly going to the borrower, indirectly going to the borrower enables for growth because these people can spend it, these people can get you the growth. So now in this model, what are the problems? Are there frictions? What are these friction points? Are there friction points? There are two major friction points, asymmetric information problem and free rider problem. Asymmetric information problem is basically the lender wants to give money to the best borrower but the most riskier borrower wants to get the lender's money too. So there is not enough transparency between the saver, the lender, and the borrower, the spender, as to what is the quality of each of these. So that is where there is asymmetric information. The one who is trying to borrow is the one who has maximum risk, most likely, because they want to borrow. But it could also be a good risk to take because their idea might be very solid. So asymmetric information problem is when there is not enough transparent access of information, which can lead to risk aversion. The borrower could be risky, so the lender just assumes I shouldn't be lending. Because there is this fear of adverse selection. That's part of asymmetric information. So adverse selection, the lender might think that, hey, I might adversely select a riskier borrower to borrow my money because the people who are borrowing are the ones who are trying to take risk. And so adverse selection is before the transaction happens, the lender is fearful that they would borrow the money, they would lend the money to the borrower who is risky. But once the transaction is done, let's say the lender has overcome that fear of adverse selection, there's still moral hazard as a second problem that can happen. Let's say the borrower has the money. They qualify, they had good credit score, and they had good history, the idea is solid, the lender had actually validated all of that, but then the borrower gets an idea. What if I take, now that I've borrowed the money, what if I make a very risky proposition, which was not my original plan? So what if the borrower now goes into a riskier proposition? That is moral hazard. In this, what happens is, post the transaction has taken place, the borrower can take higher risk. So that's another risk, which is asymmetric information problem. You don't know what they'll do after the fact of borrowing the money. So that's the post-transaction risk. 
So information asymmetry has these two issues, but there's also this free rider problem. So let's say Warren Buffett, he finds out that, hey, there's this great company that he wants to invest his money, the Berkshire Hathaway's money. And he spends 10 years doing the research and following that stock and he finally gets the price that he, he wants to buy. And so he buys it. And what, what happens within a quarter, his activities are published because of the size of his firm. So everyone finds out that, hey, Warren Buffett just sold, let's say, all the airlines or just bought Pfizer stock due to COVID. Then all of his research that he spent Everyone else can now use and piggyback that information as a free rider. They can take that information and they can invest that money too. So they'll get that benefit. So free rider problem is basically cloning. It's in a sense, people can, without doing all the hard work, without doing original hard work, they can just copy Warren Buffett or copy someone else's idea. Say you have a portfolio manager who's managing your portfolio. They do all the hard work, but you pick some of their best ideas and you invest on your own. They don't get the commission, so you are a free rider. So that's another problem. What happens then? There's less incentives for people like Warren Buffett to actually speak more and more openly because then they will miss out on those ideas to invest. So incentives for uh, sharing work and doing deep work also reduces because of, because of these two problems. So now with these, right, we are having financial frictions. If there's adverse selection, moral hazard risk, free rider problem, then there'll be friction. There'll not be enough good material available about the borrower. There'll not be enough uh, risk appetite being shared across the credit worthiness of the borrower. So these are the big problems. What are the solutions? There are two big solutions that financial intermediaries can do. First, private information. They can collect information and give private loans. They can assess the credit worthiness of the borrower by screening them, doing background checks, checking out what is their monthly pay stubs look like, what's their salary, monitoring their activities, how are they spending the money that they're spending, using a collateral to give, if before giving a home mortgage, they'll actually own the title to the home and they'll only give you the title back once you have paid back the loan. So using a collateral and even like restrictive uh, clauses that they can put in saying, hey, you can only spend this money for X purposes, even if they give you the loan. So there are various ways in which you can remove the asymmetric information problem by collecting that information, not sharing that information. Like Warren Buffett could just say, hey, I'm not gonna share all of this research. I'll just make major transactions. Then the price has already gone up by the time he's bought all of those shares. Governments, so these, this is the thing that uh, financial intermediaries can do to solve these two problems on free rider and uh, asymmetric information, the government can also help increase transparencies by prudent regulation to make sure that like having institutions, financial institutions that are powerful, like the Security and Exchange Commission, SEC, supporting accounting standards and regulations saying, hey, in the United States, there's gap accounting, GAAP, so everyone should be doing it, and, and disclosure rules are very strict. And uh, having some sort of an oversight and supervision on these institutions, on these borrowers to ensure that they are actually telling the right thing. The government can also help with credit credit score, like the security. Uh, every, every borrower today has uh, a taxpayer ID, they have a social security number, so they know my credit worthiness because they'll keep track of how am I doing. So government has a role to play in unique identification numbers, social security, I just add the SSN here, but like, how can you provide that transparency? And at the same time, encouraging these financial intermediaries to thrive, but providing them with a safety net like FDIC. Like what if, you know, there is a problem in one of those banks? It can have a cascading bank panic where people run for the money and then one bank collapses because they didn't have enough to cover for all of those people. And so then that collapses the second bank, which, which the first bank has loaned from. So safety net for banks is another major thing that the government can do to reduce financial friction so that the financial financing happens smoothly. And all of this helps with economic growth. There has been studies, uh, enough studies done to show that economic development or deepening 
with better asset allocation, better borrowing uh, reach, economic growth happens faster. There are new firms that are built. Let's take an example of China. How has China done this? So China have a lot of state-owned banks. So in the United States, most actually all of the banks are private banks, like they're private institutions. But in China, primarily they had state-owned banks initially. They did not have huge financial deepening as of until 2012, 2013, as of this book was written in this chapter, but they had a lot of capital. So huge capital and movement from agriculture, low productivity to high productivity areas of work, like manufacturing, got them to increase their exports greatly. But then they are the second biggest economy, second or the third, but then they're plateauing because financial deepening needs to happen. Tight monetary laws, institutions like the SEC need to be developed, the financial contracts need to be adhered to, the legal system has to be strong, and that's their focus right now, and that's what they've been focusing on, which is continuing to get them to grow post-2013. Similarly, in India, same story. Before independence in 1947, they were all private banks, believe me. But after 1947, they were the nationalization of the bank started. State-owned banks were nationalized. Many, many private banks were nationalized primarily to increase spending on the government's agenda of uh, utilities, agriculture development, road infrastructure development, until the 1990s, when the liberalization of the banks happened and private sector was again encouraged to enter back into the banking industry. The state-owned banks still exist in India with majority of the deposits, but that's, that's changing very quickly with private sector gaining a lot of traction. State-owned banks give a lot of social um, good, so they, they, they support social good by investing in government uh, development goals. They also support rural goals, rural development, but a lot of this is not profitable. Their deposits are also failing. They are not gaining the incremental money that they are that the private banks are getting because they have lack of innovation. The asset quality, the non-performing assets is 3x than the private sector banks. So, and it's, it's forecasted to have 9% NPAs by FY22. Then the question is, why are these state-owned banks still existing? It's primarily direct government crediting, government incentive, and the government of India realizes this. They are consolidating them for the last many years now, and they're also going towards privatization. It has lots of benefits, prioritization, consolidation, lots of benefits, more deposits. It does have more fragility, but even with that increased fragility, the growth rate will be higher as long as there are strong institutions like the SEC in the United States. There's an RBI, Reserve Bank of India, which is responsible for supervision and making sure that the fragility downsides are protected. So in all, if we take one thing out of this, financing is the core of economic growth and financial intermediaries in the developed countries play a huge role. Majority of the financing comes from the financial intermediaries. intermediaries. Financial market is a small segment, but it's growing very fast. Information asymmetry is critical. Huge role for intermediaries to improve on for solving the adverse selection problem, moral hazard, and government's role to provide a platform for high, high economic growth. Thanks.